well, this is a moment in time. And I just took it. Oop, there you go. Put it right on my bag. I said, Elon, I'm stealing a mug. He said, yeah, have one. <laughs> and take that. <laughs> then I just only need one. I don't know that much cabinet space. But I mean, <laughs> it's so classic. David, how you doing? I'm doing well. I'm in Miami right now. I'm, uh, one of the portfolio perks is uh, office set up for me whenever I come in. But you're based in New York, am I correct? I'm based in New York, yeah. That's that great view. Where is your office? We're in uh, one world. We're on the 85th floor. Amazing. So that's 85th floor. Oh my Lord. How many floors are in the building? I think they call it 100, but I think if you actually count, it's probably like 92, 93. But I think there's some marketing going on. You think what they do is they make the lobby like 10 floors and then they yeah, gives them a little yeah. bit of uh, air cover. Uh, how, how's your tooth doing? It's good. The swelling's down. And um, I was talking to my wife and I'm like, everybody's commenting in, on YouTube of how bloated and how fat my face looks. And she's like, well, it's welcome to being a woman. Everybody just talking about all your, you know, outside qualities and giving you a hard time. But uh, anyway, the swelling's down. My energy is off the off the charts. I did a cold plunge today, so I'm ready to go. Let's get to liquidity episode 13. We made it. And we've got the, uh, we got the liquidity conference, liquidity summit, go to liquiditypod.com. You'll see the summit page. It's supposed to be 100 people. I, I extended it to 125, David, because you gave me so many great recommendations for LPs to invite. Thank you very much for that. You're, you're a you're mensch. And it's just uh, GPs, LPs, three days in Napa. Uh, we get there it's the first week in June, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Sunday, we arrive, have some food and play poker. Just hang out. Monday, talks all day, dinner, poker at night. Tuesday, we have talks. Then in the afternoon, we do activities. So you go painting, cooking class, play pigeon shooting. We got a bunch of different things to do in Napa. It's such a great place to go. Then we do food and poker again. Wednesday, we have a closing brunch. So it's pretty, pretty fun agenda. What's the overall vision? You haven't told me that much. What, you know, what you I'm trying to build relationships with all these different GPs in the world because we've gotten earlier and earlier. And the way, as you know, David, for a while, people will judge uh, an early stage program like Founder University or Accelerator or Y Combinator or Techstars is how many of those companies goes on, go on to get future funding. Usually it's like 10, 20, 30 percent. And so in order to get those numbers up um, and we need to meet seed funds and Series A funds and show them our inventory. In other words, hey, these are the founders we've invested in, we think are interesting and then match them. So I just want to build relationships. Also, I want to have fun. And I just find three days together, only GPs, only LPs, no founders, no service providers, you know, like 50 service providers a month try to get into the event. Lawyers, accountants, headhunters, real estate brokers, because they, they're looking to sell, but we, we want to have like a no sales kind of situation. So there's other big events out there. There's tons of family office events, but this is my small one to pair with the podcast of what David and I are doing here. Just to build relationships with people that we think are high quality to help us all trade notes and become better at what we do. That's the Absolutely. vision. Well, I don't know. I'm excited. And Jessica's coming. So awesome. Uh, all right. Well, there you go. Hang out with us as well. Absolutely. You and I, this is the same thing. Beauty and the beast, right? You get a 10, you put it with like a four, <laughs> you, you average out to a seven. Beauty and the brains. Beauty and the brains, maybe. <laughs> I think it's in my case, it's beauty, the brains, and the beast. <laughs> All right, let's get started. Welcome back to this week's Liquidity Podcast. Uh, with me today, I have Jeff Richards, Managing Partner at Notable Capital, formerly known as GGV. We have Ryan Dennehy, CEO of unicorn startup electric.ai. And of course, we have Jason Calacanis from the Launch Fund. I'm your moderator, David Weisbert, co-founder of 10x Capital. Today, we have several great topics on the docket, down rounds, something most people don't talk about. How do they work? And are they as bad as they sound? And we'll discuss how large corporates such as United Airlines are integrating AI today. We'll finish with the latest three investments from Jeff and Jason. Let's dive right in. This September, Pitchfork reported that down rounds accounted for 11% of all VC deals, more than any time in the past two decades. That being said, down rounds were still nowhere close to the dot-com numbers where they reached a record high of 58% of all rounds. Jeff. When you look at 2024, do you take the over or under the 11% of down rounds that you had last year? It's a great question, David. Let's zoom out a little bit. So uh, to me, the down round thing, and I answer this question coming from having been a founder 
you know, back in the late nineties, early two thousands, which was, which was kind of a crazy time to raise money and then deal with the aftermath of the dot-com bubble where I raised capital and dealt with, you know, all kinds of different structures. But the down round question you mentioned, and we don't talk about it much. It's a little bit like Hollywood and Ozempic or plastic surgery. Nobody really knows who's done what. So I, I don't, it's very hard to make sense of that data. Uh, if you ask the question of what percent of private companies that raised in 21 or 22 have a lower stock price today in the public markets, it's almost all, right? Almost every small cap and mid cap tech company has a lower stock price today. And they would all love to be back where they were, but they're down 60, 70%. You look at the software market, uh, multiples peaked in 21 at 20x forward revenue. Today, they're at five to six. So even if you grew your business 3x or 4x in the last two to three years, you're fighting a headwind where multiples came down 75%. So I just don't know. I, I know the 11% data point. I, I think it's a hard one to get your head around because the reality companies that are raising money today are good companies. Uh, it is a very hard market to raise capital in if you're not a pure AI infrastructure play. And so those companies are great companies. We've seen a very challenging fundraising market. I'd be curious to see what Jason has seen over the last 12 months. But I can tell you that, you know, just dealing with the headwind of, of market multiples, folks that have been able to raise at a flat round, that's, that's the new up round. And frankly, as an investor or as a uh, founder, if you're playing the long game and you're looking five, 10 years out, an up or down round in the near term isn't going to impact the long term outlook of your business. You think about companies like Square or DoorDash that did down rounds, did rounds with structure. They went on to build multi $10 billion companies. It just didn't impact them in the long run. So, we, our advice to founders, focus on the long run, get whatever you need to get done to move on, get the capital you need to build your business and go build your business. Yeah, when, when a market crashes this severely and the tide goes out, you figure out who's wearing swim trunks and who isn't, uh, as the famous expression goes. I like your Jeff uh, plastic surgery one. Uh, although with these celebrities, when they start doing stuff to their face with the uh, Botox, like when they start doing, I heard 20, 30 year olds are doing Botox. Anyway, you, sometimes if they go too far, you can tell. There really are two types here, uh, David. There are down rounds. Okay, you raised at 100 million. Now you're raising at 50. Okay, we get it. Then there's cram down rounds. And so cram down rounds are a different beast. And I just want to talk about those for a second, because those are also happening. And they're happening with very notable companies. And these are also referred to as pay to play rounds as well. That's actually a Hollywood term. If you hire somebody to do a movie, if the movie gets made, they get paid, movie doesn't get paid made they still get paid <laughs> pay to play what's happening with the cram down rounds is a founder goes out they try to raise money they can't there's too much of an overhang in the company company's making let's say 10 million dollars in revenue last round they raised at 200 million somebody put 30 million into the company for 50 percent. they've got you know some cash left but they're still burning but they're back to growing so there's there's a company here but it, nobody wants to invest at that valuation and they don't want to invest with the 30 million, they can't raise money, they're still losing money, what do they do? They go to market, where they have somebody inside the company who's one of the three or four investors, and they say, hey, here's an idea, have you considered a cram down round? Uh, or a pay to play round? And then they go to every single investor and say, uh, we're taking all of the preference stack, 30% is owned and preferred, they're getting 5% of the company, you know, that 30% goes down to five, you're getting cut by whatever that is 80%. Uh, so you go from owning 10% of the company to two, and by the way, it's common shares. So you lose all your protective provisions, you don't get out first, you don't have information rights, you no longer have pro rata, unless we're in, we're raising 10 million for 20% of the company, the $50 million valuation right now, you've already put 10 million in. Now to keep up your percentage, here's how much you have to put in. Okay, so you want to get back to 10% ownership. You know, and it's a $50 million company, I put 5 million in new capital in. And uh, then the founders, they keep their common. Uh, so they're fine. And you know, um, the whole thing starts over again, it creates a lot of bad feelings. But it also forces people to put up or shut up. But if your fund is completely deployed. So Jeff, what fund is GGV on? We're on fund uh, eight. Yeah, now notable capital. Yeah. Uh, notable. So if this was from fund two or fund three, that funds fully deployed, what would you do, Jeff? If you're faced with this, and I'm sure you've been faced with some of these cram downs, now you're in this like very weird, precarious situation. You've got to re underwrite the thing from first principles, and it's it's contentious. It sucks. It's hard. And then how do you come up with the number? 
I've had situations where I own 1% of the company. You, they're like, you now own 0.0001% of the company. I'm like, is that fair? And it's never fair. When you get to that point, people are grasping at straws, right? As you know, I mean, you're in a desperate situation. The founder's desperate for capital. And you have a sharkish type investor who's coming in and saying, look, I could own 80% of this company, put in $5 million and own 80% of a company that was valued at $30 million. But very often what you have is an untenable situation where the company is essentially out of money. In many cases, they've already raised venture debt. They've got to pay a debt provider back. And so you've got a crossover PE type firm that comes in and says, look, we'll pay off the debt provider. We'll buy up a huge chunk of the company. It's a really challenging situation. I don't know about you, Jason. I think we're in the early days of that happening. We're in the second inning because companies raised so much money in 2021 that they've been able to run through 22, run through 23, which was a tough year for most. And unless you extended your runway for a very long period of time, which Ryan could talk about because he did that, you're now in a challenging situation and you're going to your investors and saying, gosh, this is the only option I have on the table. And it just gets very painful. And some investors have blocking rights to do the next round. So now you're in this like, you want to talk about a game of chicken uh, or a standoff, you know, okay, I can block the round and I'm not putting any more money in and we're six weeks to add a cash. So I'm, I'm literally dealing with, I don't know, you know, we have 400 portfolio companies historically, maybe 250 are active. I'm dealing with, you know, a couple of these a month. So it's, this is a very real thing happening in the market. There's two ways to protect yourself, you know, as a founder and as a management team. Number one, uh, be profitable. <laughs> Number two, have a big cash reserve. And when the, when, when the sun is shining, you get that hay, right? And so I literally was on a board call the other day and I'm like, we're crushing it. Shall we put $10 million and sell 10% of the business for $10 million or 10% of the business for $15 million? Would we do that? And the person was like, we have 18 months of runway. I'm like, yeah, we do. Let's, we're strong. Raise money when you're strong. Ryan, I guess your thoughts would be interesting here as a founder, since Jeff and I are out of the game for a little while. No, I'm glad. I'm glad you brought up, you know, the idea of like the the cram down recaps rounds just that have a lot of structure that also make them unappealing. Define structure for people in the audience who we, they hear us say structure, structure, structure all the time. What does it mean? Yeah, I mean these are going to be terms where you know, for example, a new investor comes in and let's say the the founders really want to preserve that billion dollar unicorn valuation, and the only person who's willing to give them money at that billion dollar valuation is they're going to want three times their money back before everybody else gets paid and that's not unreasonable is it to have like if you're putting money in at that ridiculous valuation no yeah. absolutely and there's a bunch of funds who who, who make, make a lot of money going around essentially just making making those types of offers but what i'm hearing in the market i get at least one sometimes two calls a week from other growth stage founders i have the you know fortunate or unfortunate benefit of this is my third venture back startups so i've seen a lot of messed up stuff um and so i get a lot of calls and the most common thing i hear is founders are trying to defy gravity to avoid facing the music and so what that means is for example is doing a lot of really unnatural things you know oh if we can just add another 10 million in net new then maybe when we go back out to to raise the money we can we can clear the last round valuation but to jeff's point which he's done a phenomenal job coaching me and, and his other founders on is that doesn't matter what matters is are you building a good business particularly today now that the tide's gone out everybody has a sharper pencil yeah you might be putting up impressive net new numbers but your cac's also through the roof your intention your retention hasn't moved anywhere and those are things that are really just only going to make your 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 business weaker um you know in in the long run so so that's one another one that i think way too many founders think that oh well someone will do the round it just might be at terms we don't like uh also not true um there is a really finite amount of it is so much and, and if i sort of put my investor hat on um and the you know 35 or so some odd uh companies I've, I've angel invested in like that's another thing i hear a lot too and like the reality is many investors and um jason and jeff keep keep me honest on this one but in many cases you'd rather cut a check into a clean story without a lot of hair on it and sort of know what you're getting versus going back to the hoop on something that maybe you've been in for a long time it's the terms are complicated a lot of bells and whistles uh and so i think that's another thing that that founders really have to let sink in it's advice they give all the time is like there might not be around out there for you and you have to operate as if 
Um, the money is far from guaranteed at any price. So I gave two pieces of advice. Hey, uh, get to break even, have a war chest. You're giving a third uh, given to you by Jeff, which is have great business fundamentals. Um, like the business, you know, which I guess is close to, you know, uh, what we would call getting to break even, et cetera. But Jeff, the CAC's got to be right because people are going to reevaluate this thing from first principles. They're going to just re-underwrite it from a blank sheet of paper uh, in these kind of situations. And I think what's happened, Jason, is, as you know, in a zero interest rate environment, people, you know, when you're getting literally zero to keep your money in a T-bill or a bank account, you're highly incentivized to throw money into the market, into risk capital, right? I want to bet on startups. I want to bet on crypto. I want to bet on whatever. When rates went up and people are getting paid five, six, seven percent, or they're getting paid nine or ten or eleven in a credit fund, those family offices, sovereign wealth funds, you know, the big giant pools of capital of the world that couldn't wait to pump their money into Silicon Valley are suddenly gone. And so there's a lot fewer investors putting money into the market. And, you know, one of the things that I've been very public about on Twitter is when I got into venture capital in 2008, the US venture capital market was supposedly around $28 billion a year. Somehow it ballooned up to $300 billion a year in 21 and 22. I would argue most of that was not venture capital. It wasn't going into seed A and B series C companies. It was the 10 billion into Stripe at 50 billion. Not really venture capital. That's mid cap tech. Those are IPOs or IPOs. And so what you have is the folks that were doing those rounds or even the growth rounds at 500 or a billion or a billion five. They have the option of buying public companies at those prices. They can say, gosh, I can buy a public company doing 500 million of revenue at 3 billion. Why would I take a flyer on this private one that has an inconsistent history, a rookie management team, et cetera, et cetera? And so the investor base that is evaluating your deal and your company has more time and they're more discerning. And to Ryan's point, the bar has been elevated. And so the way that they're looking at businesses today, the way that we're looking at businesses is just we're, we're having, a, we have very high bar and it's a great place to be as an investor. It's why I'm bullish on the next five years. I know you are as well. But as a founder, my advice to founders has been take the bull by the horns. You know, if you're sitting on the beach and it's 80 degrees out and you're putting sun lotion on and all of a sudden it starts hailing and it's 30 degrees, don't pretend like it's 80 degrees out and it's sunny. It's not sunny anymore. It's cold. Prepare for the cold, right? Get profitable, cut burn, get your business into a mode where it's attractive to those new investors who have a much higher bar than they used to. But take the bull by the horns, be responsible for your cash runway, be, be responsible for your cap table. Don't run into a situation where you're passively going out to raise capital. And ending up with a bunch of term sheets you don't really want. And David, I think one of the, the situations here is if all this advice is being given for two or three years on, you know, various podcasts of note, quietly in back rooms with uh, investors and Jeff talking to his portfolio, me talking to my portfolio, Brad Gerser out there saying get fit to public companies, you know, like the weather change, the game changing on the field was known for two full years here and and people knew it was a hot market for the, the last two years of this nonsense and they were saying it. if you're a founder and you cannot navigate your firm financially uh at scale or you know getting to scale through this uh, what probably is going to happen is people behind the scenes are going to say this person isn't fit to serve and it's a hard thing to say because you know we're such a a pro founder community and being founder friendly is critical for people like Jeff and I to get deals with people like Ryan. We want to be seen as founder friendly, but you have to ask if it's been four years, you didn't do any layoffs and you ran this thing off a cliff and you had $40 million in money in the bank and you still burned a million dollars a month. Knowing all of this, well, are, are you the best person to lead the next stage of this company? And I think a lot of people will just say no. Um, and that's what I'm hearing on the back end. Yeah, I think what's really happened is a lot of those founders that didn't change were basically paralyzed. It's people go through crises. It's not that they necessarily take wrong action; it's that they take no action. So they've kind of been sitting around uh, to to Jeff's point, you know, hoping that more capital will come in and there'll be this kind of messiah that comes in and saves them, rather than uh, doing the difficult things. And the difficult things, you have to wake up every morning. I've been a founder twice, and you have to eat that frog, do the difficult thing every day. And then the next day, do the difficult thing. It could be 18, 24 months of eating crap until you basically are able to, to be above water. Uh, but Ryan, you were in a really interesting position in that you raised almost at the height of the 
of the market, October 2021, you raised at a billion dollar valuation, raised $90 million. Then you kind of started to see the market. How did your operations evolve as the market changed? Wholesale change across the board. I mean, so, you know, exactly, you know, to the point that, that, that all of you are making. And, you know, Jason, I'm glad you brought up the, the, the point that you, you just did. Like I ran into, um, one of the partners at, at Diversa at an event. He said, we're doing more CEO searches than we ever have in the last decade. And that's because at some point, your investors, your board, they're going to be sitting around the table and they're saying like, yes, you're an operator. Yes, you're a founder, but you're a steward of this capital on behalf of us and our LPs. You have a real responsibility to figure out where does the next incremental dollar need to go or, or not go, right? And I was just having this conversation with, uh, with someone internally. There's, uh, there, there, there's a company that I, I won't name, but doing you know low nine figures uh, ARR raised a lot of money, um, kind of at the peak. Had never done any layoffs. Staff would openly admit um, that that there was a lot of bloat, and you know, they announced a five percent riff. The five percent, my COO said, he goes, "That'll get rid of the Cheetos in the break room, and, and not much else." I mean, that's it's it's no man's land, and so it's not just about making changes, but are you actually making the changes? To an extent that they're they're going to make sense and, and really bend the arc of, um, of of the business, and I think it's doubly hard when you're coming off the the sugar high of raising money every six to eight months at a huge uptick. Never had to worry about money at least you know for years and years. And and yeah, correct. In our case, you know, we raised over a hundred million dollars across two rounds between the end of 2021 and 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 early 2022. Four months after we raised our Series D extension i went back uh to the board and the investors and said we're going to do our first riff and then we did another one and then we did another one um and then we we committed to completely rewiring our go-to-market motion completely reimagining the uh product and the feature and the functionality all of that to really guide us in a direction where we could still deliver on the mission of the company but we could do it orders of magnitude more efficiently uh, and more effectively than we were doing it before. I had to learn that the hard way. My first two companies, even though they both had uh, small but successful exits, were weeks away from running out of money. And, and what I knew coming out of those experiences in my first two companies is it's always in the final days when the, when the movie's almost over that you go, oh, but we were just starting to figure it out. We were just, I mean, how many Let times have you talked- Let me ask you, you a question, Ryan. You did three riffs. When you look back on it, should you have done two? Should you have done one? Should you have ripped the Band-Aid off quicker? And then take me through the psychology of being a founder and how absolutely arduous, painful, and how much suffering goes into doing these reductions in workforce layoffs. It's unbelievable. And obviously, we would have, we would have loved to have just one and done. I mean, that is always, you, you want to you cut deep. You want to do it once. Uh, and, and, and move on and be able to focus and, and know you have the team. I think that the difference with us is we were going from a model that was sort of a mix of software and services, a big inside sales model, to really reimagining this as pure SaaS, bottoms up, product-led growth. And so it wasn't clear until a little bit further into the cycle exactly what the go to market mode you know exactly what the sort of 2.0 version of the business was was going to look like only then did it become clear hey here's a cost structure that makes a lot more sense with what we know the business is is today and i don't think that not every business has that problem i will say though i think that there are a lot more companies out there that need to do a much more sort of wholesale rewiring of how they make money how they serve their customers you know, I think you, we, we all know it's like, yo, you can't cut your way to growth. Uh, you can and you can't. You can't cut your way to growth if you're just going to do the same thing you've been doing for the last seven years with less money. If you commit to running a more efficient business and you, and you commit to the product and the organizational change to do that, you can absolutely spend less money and, act- and, and grow faster. And this is the high degree of difficulty, Je- uh, Ryan uh, and Jeff. I would like your input on this because you and I were former founders who are now capital allocators. You know, you're being asked to cut costs and at the same time, innovate in product uh, and then increase sales. And so seemingly, this seems like, well, these are counterintuitive. Wait, we have to invest to get growth. It turns out 
slowing down, getting rid of, uh, you know, excess in an organization and excess can come in many forms. It could come in, you know, just undisciplined marketing spend, undisciplined product development, whatever it is, undisciplined T and E and, and, and office space, whatever it is. Um, but if you start getting efficient and then you start having constraint, what you find in an organization is, uh, people figure out how to do things quicker. And this is one of Elon's tricks is he just says, you know, they're like, oh, this is gonna take six months. He's like, okay, I, I give me a way to do it in six um, days. And I'm on a board right now. And they showed me it's a, it's an e commerce company, I wish there was one. And they're, they, they stayed away from Amazon for a long time, they b- believed in building direct, but they, they had competitors and knockoffs just crushing it on Amazon. So we, we could not not be on Amazon. So we said, okay, we have to have an Amazon strategy out of the gate, it goes explosive. And so they're like, we're gonna double Amazon next year. And I said, hold on a second. We're gonna double Amazon next year. Give me a plan for 10xing Amazon this year. And they were like, "What?" I'm like, "Yeah, we're we're starting from a very low point. It's low single digit percentages of our sales. Give me a 10x. Show it to me in 10 days, and then 10 weeks after that, I want to see if we hit 10x or not, and then I want to plan to go 10x again." And you know, most times that unrealistic thing, I, you know, um, you would think on its face, Jeff, you know you would seem like a lunatic. You know what it did? It worked. Inspired people and it worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And people are like, wow, we, we think we got a 5X from this. We found this other thing. There's subscribe and save. You know, we didn't realize how big Amazon is in this other geo. We found this consulting firm that said we can do coupons and we discovered coupon. And I'm like, this is what I'm talking about. Let's do less with more. And I, I did the same thing with our team. I want to meet more founders. I want to do more introductory calls. Because I believe deal flow is your destiny in this business. So I said, how do we do a hundred first time calls per week? Oh my God, a hundred for, I mean, look at Jeff's eyes, but a hundred calls a week. We were a 21 <laughs> person firm. That's great. It's just a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. 70 people. I said, okay, yeah. here's how I want you to do it. Call it an introductory call. Tell the founder, we don't want to waste their time framing matters. It's only going to be 15 minutes of them presenting their company and five minutes of us explaining to them how we invest. And making sure we understand their vision and then determining if a second call with a more senior person is a good idea for them because we don't want to waste their time. Mm-hmm. So we reframed it. You know, shout out Scott Adams, creator of Gilbert. Um, we reframed it. He's he's big on reframing, but that's a concept of psychology for decades. You know, to be only 20 minutes. Well, now if it takes an hour to write the coverage or whatever, you know, round it up to two hours of work for an associate or a researcher. Okay, yeah, they could do three a day, four a day. Okay, so now you do 15, 20 of these a week. Okay, how many people do you need? You need five people. Is that possible? I did 70 last week, 60 or 70. So I'm almost to 100. It all goes in a database. It's going to be pretty good game for changer. returns. I think. Yeah, it's a game changer. It's a I game think changer. The, the other thing I'd add, Jason, you know, R- Ryan gave some great context into what he did. I think the, uh, the broader... Uh, I, I, some additional color I would give on his scenario because I was I was uh, involved with it day to day. But he has a great set of advisors around him. He has Dick Costello and Adam Bain, who used to run Twitter. He's got um, uh, Tim. We've got a CEO on our board. We've got Emmanuel Scala, who was the chief customer officer at Toast. We've got Bob Goodman from Bessemer and myself. Ryan's got a good sounding board of people. And as we were heading into the late stages of twenty one and into twenty two, he's raising all this capital. He wasn't afraid to call us either and say, hey, guys, there's some things in the business that aren't working, and I think we should put them on the table and talk about them. That led into that summertime conversation in 22, Ryan. I remember when you called me and said, hey, I think we got to blow this thing up. Like, we got some things that are just not working in this business, and I want us to be in five or 10 years. I want to be a higher margin, higher growth, channel-driven business, and here's how I think we should do it. A lot of founders are afraid to have that conversation with their board and with their investors, and so... A lot of credit to Ryan. Some of that's being a third-time founder to have the confidence to do that. But a lot of it was building the relationships with those people over the years. He didn't just pull that board together in the summer of 22, you know, off of some angelist recruiting site. He had carefully handpicked these folks over years and built relationships. And so when the time came to really deal with this sort of like wartime mode, he had good people around him. And, and one of the things I see in the market today is I get these founders coming to us, Jason, at Series B and C who are still burning a ton of cash. And I say, well, who, who are your mentors and advisors? And they say, gosh, I, I, do you have any recommendations? They don't have anybody. 
They have nobody that's giving them good counsel. And in many cases, they've got junior investors on their board who aren't giving them great advice. And so it can be a really challenging and lonely place to be if you're a CEO. So one of my main pieces of advice, I know, Ryan, you share this with folks all the time who are at Series A and B is cultivate those relationships with advisors, board members, people who actually want to have an interest in helping you be successful because you may not think you need them today when things are going well. But when you hit stormy seas, it's invaluable. I don't know, Ryan, if you want to add any color to that. But to me, it was a huge part of your process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, you know, the other part of it, too, though, just kind of, Jason, go back to your, your, your comment, too, about when you throw that audacious goal out there, like, Jeff, something you talk about a lot is just creating situations where there's nowhere to hide, right? And, like, that's one of them. When you go to a team and you say, oh, yeah, I know we only put 100 customers on the new product last quarter. So this quarter, we're going to 1,000. You don't have any more money or any more people to do it. The right people are going to jump out of their chair and be like, I don't know how we're going to do it, but like, man, like we're going to, you know, we're, we're going to go try. And, and, and the wrong people are going to kick and scream and come back to you the next week with all the reasons why, um, you know, why they can't do it. But, but now more than ever, as companies are making changes like this, like that's one of the things that, that I think and, and it's a piece of advice to give to other founders is like, that's what you need to ask of your people. It's not about the in- little incremental improvements each quarter. If you're going to reduce costs, let's really reduce cost. Uh, if we're going to launch a new product, we want to scale quickly. Like, let's really figure out how, uh, you know, how, how, how far we can take it. And, and all of that is, is made much, much easier by having people around the table who are ex operators who bring a diversity of viewpoints. And, um, you know, in my case, seven out of 10 times I bring a question to someone like a Tim or Emmanuel on my board. They might just agree with me or kind of repeat that, but it's you're building that muscle memory and that then that validation to trust your instincts and and make decisions faster. And, and so I think all of these things are critical right now. Speaking of cutting costs, United CIO, Chief Information Officer, Jason Birnbaum is going all in on AI. United is reportedly using AI for everything from chatbots to pilot announcements, and we'll be piloting AI applications across the entire company. Ryan, you're founder and CEO of Electric.ai. You were early on the AI thesis, and you help small businesses integrate IT solutions, including AI. What are you seeing across the thousands of SMBs that you service? My guess is that this airline CEO a year and a half ago was all in on Web3. So, <laughs> I mean, I'm, ha- I'm half joking, but I, I'm, I'm somewhat wary of uh, people that make big, splashy public announcements. I am not poo-pooing the, the commercial applications and the, the potential business transformation that a lot of these, these new tools can, can bring. Specifically for us at Electric, we're making IT really easy for small businesses. They don't really care how we do it. They care that it gets done. They care that they can click a button and the computer gets provisioned and sent to uh, the new hire. They care that they can click a button and we can tell them a whole bunch of things about how they can make their environment more secure. I think uh, AI for the time being is certainly a useful uh, buzzword. It's a it's a useful hook. It's getting a, a certain type of early adopter SMB customer um, in, into our funnel, but but specifically on this end of the market. You know, if you do a great job with your software, it kind of disappears in the background. And so, you know, I think ultimately, you know, one of the things we talk about a lot internally is that, you know, AI didn't over, you know, all of a sudden overnight change the fundamentals of product management, right? You you start with the problem and work backwards. And I think there's a lot of great things that, that AI can do to accelerate the solutions that you want to deliver to your customers. Um, you know, beyond that, I think I, I probably have a bit more skepticism than, than some people. I'm very curious, Ryan, you've fractionalized IT services for electric. Do you see the fractionalization of AI in the future where large companies will have their internal AI teams and tools, but you'll see SMBs uh, benefit from broader platforms? Yeah, specifically, I think like vertical SaaS and, and SMB vertical SaaS stands to gain the most from, from AI as we've probably all seen playing around in these, in these LLMs. They do much better when they can uh, index something more specific than the entire internet, right? And so when you're dealing with uh, a constrained set of problems, uh, a constrained set of intended solutions, and in, like many vertical SaaS companies, you're sitting on a, a, a pretty juicy proprietary uh, data set. 
you can do some really cool stuff with that and you can produce, I think, extraordinary um, customer outcomes. So that's, that's the part I get really excited about is, is, you know, I think a lot of these companies don't need to be built um, new from scratch. I think there's a lot of great companies that might have been around 7, 10, 12 years that are actually in pole position to become the next great AI story because they have a 90 yard head start with an existing solution, existing data, existing uh, set of customers. And, you know, now with the air cover of uh, all this macro uncertainty and, and a lot of businesses rewriting the way they do things, this is a great time for, I think, a lot of those companies to reimagine themselves and what they can do with this technology. Jeff, I see you uh, nodding your head. How do you see enterprise companies integrating AI? Yeah, I think, look, Ryan makes the, a great point about companies wanting to sort of jump onto the bandwagon. We, we see this in venture capital. You know, uh, you go back a decade ago and there were folks creating funds dedicated to mobile apps. There were people who created, you know, clean tech funds that sort of were there and then went away. So I think, look, I've been in Silicon Valley since 1995. We, you get these paradigm shifts every decade or so. We had it with dot com and the internet. We had it with, um, cloud and mobile. I think this is a massive paradigm shift. I think this is probably bigger than those because the world is ready for it. The infrastructure is there. The compute is there. You know, if you think about the SMB segment where Ryan plays, one of the reasons we're so bullish on that segment, it's 42% of US GDP. It's 55% of US employment. SMBs 15 years ago didn't have any technology. Most of them didn't even have internet access in their shop. Now they're running Shopify for e-commerce. They're running Square for payments. They're running Toast inside their business. They're running Homebase for payroll and time clock management. They've all bought technology and the layer is there for now as to, to Ryan's point for the incumbent vendors to roll out AI features and modules that make those businesses more productive. And I think one of the cool things there, it's not going to be a headwind for labor. Okay. In big tech, we're definitely seeing a headwind for labor because of AI. We saw that, you know, Jason mentioned the efficiency wave with Zuck and Elon and others. Um, and I think everybody's gotten religion around the idea you can build much bigger companies today than you used to with less headcount. In small business, if you take the average 10 person shop, the owner is doing accounting, the owner is doing finance, the owner is doing sales, marketing, payroll, et cetera. So when you give them an AI tool built on top of their existing software or a module on top of their existing software that can do those things for them, it's going to make that shop that much more productive. It's not going to allow them to eliminate headcount inside the shop because nobody's doing those functions inside the shop. If you take that 42% of US GDP in America and you give it a 5 or 10% boost because of AI, that's huge. That's huge for our economy. And so one of the things I'd love to see us, you know, get the narrative out, there's a lot of negative headlines around AI, it's going to reduce labor, the robots are coming, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not saying those are valid questions. I just don't know why nobody's focusing on the potential benefit of this technology, particularly to small business, which is almost half of our economy. I think it's going to be huge and we're betting big on it. I think for LPs, it's a category that will generate a ton of returns. As Ryan mentioned, it'll probably come from companies we've already funded. And one of the challenges in the venture capital world today, it's not that easy to go fund new ideas in AI other than the infrastructure space. In the application layer space, it's a little bit hard to imagine a brand new company today coming in with something with AI that will displace a, call it 100 million ARR business that already has thousands of customers because they're rolling out that same functionality. Other... Depends on the category. Depends on the category. Yeah, I might take the other side of it. I, I think it's a low probability that somebody coming in with an AI first solution displaces the incumbent. But it's possible. And so, I, you know, we and when they do, that. it'll be big. Yeah. Yeah. Or they can, you know, M&A can, can take them out. So it's just such a transformative uh, technology. And I don't see a world in which all workers do not become a minimum of one or 2% more efficient every month because of it. I I'm picking the lowest possibility 2%. That means every 35 months, everybody's twice as good at their jobs. Just take the rule of 72, right? Um, now, if people were, you know, became, you know, 5%, 6%, maybe even 7% better at their jobs every month, which I do think in certain jobs is not just possible, but probable. We can all think of a developer getting 7% better every month at writing code. We can all think about a writer uh, or a researcher or an SDR or an account executive getting 7% every month. That means every 10 months or 10.2 months, you can look up the rule of 72. <laughs> they're gonna get twice as good at their jobs. And so this is why I think it's, it, there's, you know, at, 
like all of these hype waves, whether it's mobile, broadband, cloud, y- you have this weird, you know, overhyped, underhyped, you know, moments that happen, overfunded, underfunded. Um, you got to take a relentless paced approach to this as a founder for those founders who are listening. And as an investor, I think you just have to let the founders show you how they're using it and then look for those, those clues. We have an incredible company called podcastai.com and they did a very simple thing for us. And the podcast, the, the liquidity pod.com uses them. And uh, so does uh, this week in startups.com. It started with taking every episode, transcribing it. By the way, that used to be a $500 to $1,000 per hour to get a decent transcript. You know, then it became an international thing. And it because it used to be like $5 a minute here, $10 a minute in the US. International made it one to $3 a minute using people in Manila, but you know, it had error rates. Now it's getting better and better and better. Now it's telling us the chapters in each of these. Then it's giving us what clips we should do. Now it's uploading those clips to Twitter and LinkedIn for us. So you start looking you know, every quarter, this company, podcastai.com, uh, which we've invested in three times, they release something that we buy. I pay $500 a month for this. And I'm like, charge us 2000 a month, 1000 a month, and we'd still pay it. But anyway, and then our producers here at this podcast and, you know, uh, and at This Week in Startups, they free up 10 hours a week. Well, what can they do with that 10 hours? They can do better research uh, for each episode. They can book better guests. There's always something to do to make this better. Um, and then they came to me today and they said, oh, by the way, um, if you tell us who your next guest is, we're going to go out for all the web, find the podcast, YouTube videos, social medias of that person and build you some notes. And I'm like, okay, here we go. Now, (laughs) this idea of getting 7% better a month at being a podcast producer is here. And who are they going up against? A WordPress site is what we used to use, but it didn't have any of this functionality. A WordPress site was just, you know. Shout out to my friend Matt Mullenweg and Brian Alvey over there. Fantastic. The greatest publishing platform in the world. But you start thinking about a niche like podcasting and then you put AI on it and you have a team of, you know, right now they're three people, but they were 30 people. Oh my Lord. But like, w- what they're going to do is just going to, you know, uh, free us to do so much more work. So I-, I am over the moon with the application layer. Imagine every small business in America, you're, you're running a $500,000, a bit small business that does $500,000 a year. And you get a 10% bump in cash flow because you're better at sales and marketing, you're better at finance and accounting, you're saving money on your taxes. That 50K almost just sort of appears out of nowhere. It doesn't hurt anyone. Where does that 50K get spent? It gets recycled back into the growth of the business, potentially gets recycled into more headcount. So I just think long term, I put a long thread about this on Twitter. I started writing and just kept going. I just don't see how this isn't a huge tailwind for our economy. I feel like this paradigm, and you and I lived through the dot-com era, Ryan, I'm not sure how old you are if you did, but I feel like if you take all the different paradigm shifts we lived lived through, and I lived through the PC era, which was after client server and the cloud era, the online era, broadband era, mobile era, cloud era, I think that's all the eras, and then AI, it, it feels like this is the culmination of all those. In other words, everything has been a setup to this point. And we're seeing and we're funding companies in the pre-seed stage that get to 250K in revenue per year with two people, three people. And they're like, yeah, I'm like, how much are you going to raise? And normally it would be $3 million seed round. And they're like, yeah, how about 500K for 5%? And I'm like, well, if you're going to go out and raise, why not raise 2 million? I'm like, I don't think we know how to, where we'd spend it. Oh, whoa. That's a very interesting moment for LPs and VCs to noodle on. Maybe they don't need as much money from us. Maybe we're the problem. Maybe dropping too much money into this, you know, system the same way in America, we dropped too many calories on America and 60, 70% of the country got fat. Who's responsible for that? You know, big ag, we had a really great idea. There was this thing called dwarf wheat and they, they did these wheat studies of how to get more calories out of a hectare. Acre. Um, and you can look up the dwarf wheat studies. I think it happened in Mexico and all these great scientists came together into all these hybrid versions of wheat. And the book Wheat Belly and other things go over this. They were so good at concentrating calories into the wheat chaff that they made it so fat and the husk so thin that it made it a super wheat. That wheat spiked your blood sugar and made you fat. And the reason they call it dwarf is because it was so fat, the husk, that it would break the long strand of uh, a wheat, like, you know, amber waves of gold kind of situation. So they just said, oh, let's just make them shorter. 
so they don't fall over. Sometimes you can just make something so efficient that it makes everybody fat. And the reason we're fat today is just bread and calories. Well, when you started and cereal. talking about super wheat, I thought you were talking about something else that's very popular here in California. <laughs> <laughs> well, a whole different it, economy. But it's a great point because if you think about it, like my my first company uh, started in two thousand seven. Okay, back then it was impossible to raise money. If you did raise money, maybe you raised a few million bucks. Maybe, maybe, maybe really big. You raised like ten or twenty, and that was like the absolute most. And like there was a time when we all believed like software is efficient software businesses have these big margins and you can you know and i think there there's almost kind of like uh it's come full circle in that sense because um you know jason to your point it's like this culmination of all of, of all these different eras right like this you know and, and and jeff to your point about the productivity increase right like this isn't an ai headwind that's gonna you know negatively impact the average american worker like this is an ai stimulus that no one's really talking about yet and back in the 99, 2000 era, we raised money to build data centers. We, there was no AWS. We ran little mini data centers all over the country. That's where the and money how went. much did that cost? It cost a fortune, right? It cost per a startup, fortune. What did it cost per startup to put up your co-location? It was so expensive. It was so million? expensive. We, we weren't million? even, the world SaaS hadn't been invested, invented. We were a, an ASP back then. But you had to raise capital to buy hardware, build your own data centers, pay for the bandwidth. And then Amazon came along and solved that for everybody. So I just think this is the net. This is knowing what we know now about how transformational AWS was. It's hard not to look at this wave and say, gosh, this is going to be a huge turbocharger for our economy. I 10X just ask what yeah. AWS did. Yeah. That went from, a, I think the average startup probably spent 500K in the first year to set this up, about 250K in servers. I know we did at Mahalo when I did my last startup, Mahalo. We spent about a quarter million dollars putting servers together and putting bandwidth together at a co-location facility. Plus, you had to have two uh, sysadmins, sysops people. So you're at about half a million dollars and then steady state, probably a half million dollars a year. So first three years, we probably spent 1.5 million. Our friends at Microsoft, uh, our friends at Oracle, um, they're being really aggressive and trying to get into the startup community. I've, I've had good relationships with both of them. Um, th they'll offer our startups you know, $100,000, $250,000 in credits. And that covers them for the first five years. So it went from $1.5 million over three years to free. I mean, that's extraordinary. And just going up a level, Jason, you know, David, you mentioned LPs. How are they looking at this whole AI universe? And there's been a lot of capital thrown into the infrastructure layer. All of that money that is being spent on infrastructure, not only by Amazon, Microsoft, Google, et cetera, but some of the newer companies, OpenAI and Anthropic and, uh, you know, these other companies that are raising capital is going to benefit the startup community that we're talking about. And I think, I think the output of that, one of the reasons all of us are bullish on the next three, five, seven years, you're going to have more well-run companies that need to raise less capital. The founders are going to own more. Investors will get a better return on their capital. And the outcomes could be bigger. We should have more profitable companies where the outcomes are bigger because some of those infrastructure companies today are absorbing, they're going to spend a lot of money. I mean, one of the challenges Sam has publicly talked about with OpenAI, he had to go out and raise billions of dollars to build out the infrastructure for OpenAI. It wasn't doable on a shoestring budget. But once all that infrastructure is there, it's kind of what level three did for the internet way back when, go back 20 years ago. Somebody had to build out all the bandwidth that we're now running on the internet on. And it was very expensive and there was a bubble and it popped and level three stock tank. But the output of that was there was fiber everywhere. And we take sort of gig to the home for granted. But, you know, wind back the clock 15, 17, 20 years ago, you couldn't get fiber to the home. Yeah. Look at this. The headline you just put up. All that fiber that people thought <laughs> was crazy. Yeah. 2002. It, people thought it was crazy. And today it's all getting used. And think yeah. about all the amazing things that are happening in science and healthcare and banking and all these other things. We're in the first or second inning of even understanding what this next wave of AI is going to do. You know, they overbuilt fiber to the point at which the companies went out of business. Yeah. They invested so much and they couldn't sell it. They went out of business. And then Google and other folks bought this fiber up. It became, there was a term, dark fiber, fiber laying around. Jeff and I are old enough to remember these days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the 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 paradox, the irony, was internet traffic. They were correct. Internet traffic continued to grow. Who was the beneficiary? The beneficiary of all this was YouTube mm -hmm. and Netflix, uh, Dropbox, 
you couldn't build applications like that in the 90s. In fact, my friend Mark Cuban, who did broadcast.com said YouTube and Netflix are insane. It will never work. They will break the internet. And in some ways, he was right. If everybody had gotten onto Netflix at the same time, YouTube at the same time, and it had gotten to where it is now, but we, we were able to keep up with it. A lot of other things happened with compression and storage and the plumbing costs of storage. But sometimes it overbuild and a glut. It, it kind of makes people be like, oh, yeah, I, you know, I, I can get uh, truffles and lobster at a lower price. Yeah, let's make, you know, lobster sandwiches <laughs> for everybody and we'll charge 20 bucks. I'm like if there were too many lobsters available and, you know, in New York at the turn of the century, lobsters were so available. It's what poor people ate. They were considered like the cockroaches of the ocean and they take them out of the East River in the 1800s. And that's what poor people ate because everybody else is like, oh, my God, you want to eat those things, those bottom feeders like nobody wants that. Supply went down, they became elite uh, items. But it's really uh, such a great thing. And I, I just wonder, are we going to be sitting here in two or three years, and there's h 100s and data centers everywhere. And the software developers have figured out how to build these language models so efficiently and small, and in verticals, that you don't need all this. Um, and you know, people like Grok doing inference so well and efficiently, they, you know, get rid of 99% of what people need in terms of compute this could go in the opposite direction if we overbuild so i i am fascinated to watch this um one of the things i think with these generational transfers is that every time the game changes you mentioned the early 2000s it was about who could fundraise five ten million dollars pre-product then it went to the engineering phase whereas who could build the best product one of the inevitable things that i think we'll see in the next five to ten years is who could distribute their product in the most effective way you see the rise of influencers you see other clever ways to hack distribution uh, i think will be an inevitable battle line once you have products that are able to scale very quickly and very cost effectively well one of the reasons i love where ryan is sitting is he is sitting at the epicenter of the way small businesses buy software and technology that that you know if you wind back the clock to why bessemer and notable and a bunch of other good firms got excited about his vision it was Here's a $500 billion category where small businesses spend on technology, and we're going to sit at the center of that. And, you know, Ryan, you mentioned earlier, we're joking that you bought the domain for $50 because nobody was buying AI domains, but you were ahead of the curve. And I think we're seeing that today. A lot of businesses that we're pretty excited about at Series B and C and D got started seven, eight years ago and made the bet on this AI trend before it was cool. Yeah, exactly. And also, you know, Jason, your point about, you know, like YouTube, for example, being the beneficiary of, you know, kind of in the dot com era, everyone laying all this fiber and building the infrastructure. I think folks in the application layer, uh, we're going to reap a lot of benefits of a lot of the money being put in the ground now. I mean, you know, one, one thing we, we've talked about internally here is if you think about like who is the biggest winner as a result of refrigeration technology, it wasn't the refrigerator companies, it was Coca Cola. Ah. Should give us another minute to figure that out. Like, huh, who was it? I was going to think ice because ice, you know, you had to, um, there were people who were taking ice from Canada or something, cutting right, it up or right, whatever, right. putting it in boxes and, and putting it in yeah. boxes and there were ice delivery. So like then all of a sudden you could make your ice at home and that was like pretty crazy. I'm also wondering if like meat and milk going bad and you know, you could have your milk for longer, but that's more efficient on the consumer side. But yeah, Coca-Cola. Ooh, yeah, and stuff like, like this. Like cold warm, cold. warm Coca Cola is awful, right? And so with that, ice cold Coke is delish. Yeah, uh, and so I think you know all of this stuff to me. It kind of feels like a, 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 a tale as old as time, right? You know, you look at sort of like the size of a computer that would be you know needed to to do you know basically what a Casio watch uh, could do today. Um, you know, it, it's it's the same. I mean, how many times has this cycle re repeated itself? So I think yeah, the point about yeah, some some engineers somewhere are going to figure out how. Yeah, you know, they can operate their own models with uh, vastly less compute. That's probably something that will happen. Um, and again, I think folks in the application layer who are solving very specific, um, often vertically oriented business problems stand to be some of the biggest winners. And it's all tied together in the economy, right? I had lunch yesterday with a guy who started a chain of restaurants. He's got several locations in the Bay Area, and he was telling me how he started his business pre-pandemic, but just as DoorDash was starting to get scale. And he said, I don't know if you could build my business today without that. I rode that tailwind on Uber, Uber Eats, DoorDash. We built a social media business where people understand who our, what our brand is. We've got, we're doing a lot of volume. He has a location in San Francisco that the area 
no longer has as many people living there, no longer has people coming into the office. And so the foot traffic went way down, but their DoorDash traffic has gone way up. And so there's just, there's all these interplays in the economy that I don't think we quite understand yet. I think economists are really, you know, everybody's projecting recession for the last two years. It didn't happen. Why not? People are having a very hard time getting their head around all these different variables. We've got a record number of people that have started small businesses, right? 10, 15 million small business applications in the last three, four years. We've never seen anything like it and nobody can get their heads around it. Well, guess what? They've got Shopify, they've got Square, they've got all these tools and technologies they can use to launch a business today. So it's just, I just think we're in the middle of a really interesting time frame where all these things are connected. And AI, Jason, back to your point about productivity, it's going to be a turbocharger. It's going to be like lighter fluid on a fire that's just getting going around technology. It's going to be, it's a good reason to be long. Having said that, I do think we're just entering into the it's overhyped cycle. So For back sure, half of 24, cycle. it's overhyped. Yeah. Stocks yeah. are going to take a hit. People are going to be on TV saying, all oh, these guys have no real AI. Yep. And then in 25 and 26, you'll see these things that come out of nowhere and everybody's like, yeah. oh my God, I can't believe all the success. I think there's like a major macro discussion that has occurred for the past two or three years that we're going to need to reset going into 20 or as we wrap up 2024 here and go to the back, back nine, which is, wait a second, all these layoffs were done, companies got stronger. We thought that earnings were going to go down, but earnings are a function of how much you spend to make money and the earnings are doing fabulous. And the efficiency means you can be Uber and Uber, I think, didn't add any employees for two years, but they keep growing 30%. And, you know, obviously, we saw what happened at X, but meta getting rid of 20 or 30,000 people, I'm not sure what the exact number was. And you know, he's going to do it again. There's a rumor he's going to do another 10. It's like already you you five x your stock from $92 where I bought it up to 500 or whatever it was, it took a little hit today. But there's a macro discussion here of how come unemployment is so low? How come inflation, you know, gets to 3%? We can't get it back down. We're still at five, whatever we're at, you know, in terms of like the rate cuts and we're not having rate cuts, like what is going on in the actual economy in America that, you know, we, it feels like people should be in a panic. And then I open up like TikTok or Twitter and I, I start seeing, because I like to look at layoff talk, which is like a very specific TikTok. Um, cause I, I, I like to have my finger on that cause I'm, I'm hiring. I'm going to, I'm going to hire three, four, five people this year. Um, and I, I'm investing in our business. I'm like, hmm, these people are saying they can't find jobs or that they're finding jobs that are 50% that are offering 50% less salary. And I'm like, huh. So that's what's going on here. It It's not that the economy is going to crash or something. It's that I think leadership is taking it really seriously. This, you know, get fit movement that Brad Gerstner talked about a whole bunch or that Elon kind of led. And I think Brad kind of named it after that. And then pushed Zuck to do it, and he did it. Now it's got all this momentum about getting fit. You know, part of getting fit is saying, you know what, we used to pay 150k for your position, but we can have somebody out of school do it for 70. And you know what, there's people in Portugal and Manila who will do it for 35. And that's a very weird thing that occurred, Jeff, because you you mentioned remote work essentially. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think what remote work is, is such a major driver of this. Huge. What lead? What leadership figured out during COVID? I know I did. Was that, you know, hiring somebody in another country who doesn't care about stock options or carry in a venture firm like this? They don't have this in Portugal or Manila, or whatever. So that's like they don't even want it. They, you, you would have to like spend m months explaining it to them for them to even care about it. And they probably wouldn't. They would think it's some kind of a scam. Putting that aside. I have uh, two virtual uh, folks. I'll talk about this another. I'm going to make an announcement about these, this virtual investment I made next week in, in a virtual uh, assistant company. And I'm the first investor in it, um, but I don't want to spoil it yet. I'm going to announce next week. And this company, um, we have two virtual assistants for $36,000 a year each. And then I compare them to entry-level Americans. And they're both in the Slack. They're and they cost half the price, and somebody else manages them and trains them. And if they don't work out, they give you a new one next week. And I'm like, huh, I don't know. There's about a third of jobs I could see these folks doing. Uh, hmm. What are the constraints, Jason? So obviously, they could replace many other functions, but what functions could a remote not replace? You tell me. 
you know, because how much of what we do is in person now. And did you see the uh, New York? There was a restaurant that had a, uh, you know, the standard. You, you said you're an investor in Toast, by the way, Jeff. No, but one of the uh, f- a former exec from Toast is on the board uh, of Electric with Ryan Emanuel Scala. She's terrific. I mean, think about how Toast just has changed the restaurant business. You don't need waiters. You just need runners. Transformational. And by the way, if you've got kids and you got to order an extra round of dumplings, trying to flag a waiter down for 10 minutes is death. But ordering it and getting it to your table in 10 minutes is life. <laughs> you know, especially when, you know, two eight-year-old daughters are fighting over who got the last dumpling. They had a person from Manila, Philippines, somewhere, or India. It's, it's like 1 a.m. their time. They're taking New Yorkers orders over Zoom. They're literally just in a Zoom window. And Zoom, basically 24 hours a day for free. <laughs> And so you can order from the kiosk or you can order from the woman on the computer. Hmm. Okay, that person's getting paid. I, I can tell you what people in Manila get paid. Cashier in Manila gets paid a dollar an hour. Um, yeah. A serious person, you know, with a college education gets paid five an hour. So you start thinking, you know, 10,000, 12,000 a year is like what a edu- college educated person gets. Two or three thousand dollars a year is what a cashier would get, a non trained person, a very, you know, entry level, first rung. So, um, yeah, it's kind of nuts. And if a restaurant can figure it out, what's happening in corporate America, Ryan? I just hired a phenomenal executive assistant in the Philippines. He's fantastic. On top of things, uh, hard to imagine going back. And yeah, got us thinking internally, you know, what, what, yeah, what, you know, what, what else is there, right? Uh, and I think you know, I think to when I moved back to New York City in 2016, and you know, Google had that big office over uh, over in meatpacking, and had a couple friends who worked there. And said, oh, come by, we've got this sushi chef and you know, all this stuff. And I go over there, and there's a table full of product managers bragging about the fact that they can't remember the last time they did any meaningful amount of work in a given day, and they're all making you know five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars a year, and I think rightfully, yeah, you know, that was the biggest heist in tech for a long time. It's like, I'm just going to go there and hang out and do nothing for a while and like make way too much money. And then people are surprised when those jobs start evaporating. So I think there's going to be a flight to quality. There's going to be a flight to um, what are the things that you as a human can do and you can do better than, um, you know, than, than anyone else. Um, but, you know, even, even for us, you know, we've got some phenomenal stateside engineers. We also have a lot of excellent people uh, in Brazil, both uh, ICs and, and, and engineering managers. And so I, it's, it's hard for me to imagine a world where to be competitive, you don't think globally and don't think much more holistically about where everyone sits and what that means for the business. And that process of working with those folks overseas has gotten so smooth. I have another company that I'm involved in where, Jason, back to your point about setting aggressive goals. I remember we were having a December board meeting and the founder said, we want to move all of our basically front end lead gen and go to market to this other area uh, in Argentina by June. And several of the board members said, well, why don't we do it by April? And he said, well, that seems a little crazy. We got a lot of this. And ultimately he said, you know what? Let's do it. We'll do it by April because we're going to learn in that three month window from April to June. We're going to, we're going to make some mistakes. We're also going to learn a ton. Guess what? Rolled it out, did it, cut their CAC in half. It's going to be the reason that he's pointing the company towards profitability later this year. So savvy, sophisticated founders, they're not waiting. They're figuring this stuff out. AI is going to play a role. Offshore is going to play a role. And all of it is connected because of remote, right? We we are now much more comfortable as a society working remote. Think about our industry. I mean, we're a tiny microcosm of, of, of the universe, but how much more effective are we as investors meeting people over Zoom than we were five years ago? I remember driving around San Francisco, walking up and down streets. You maybe met two or three people in a day. Now I can meet five or six founders in, in a day, half hour. It's better for them. It's better for us. If there's a great fit, we get together in person. I met somebody today. We're getting together tomorrow in person for lunch. It's a way better model. It's way more efficient. You apply that on a bunch of other industries that really matter to our economy. And I just think it's going to be not only the virtual piece, but the AI piece is going to be a huge, a huge tailwind. And to your point, Ryan, how much time did you spend raising money for your startup pre-COVID and like going to Santo Road and taking meetings? You Even in an aggressive day where you said, I'm going to do four meetings a day, you know, that's a lot. And you'd have a driver 
and you would be, you know, no. two hours at Sequoia, two hours at Kleiner, two hours I mean, at-, at-, at my last company, it got to a point where my co-founder and I said, he, he goes, literally, he's like, you need to stay in the office and run the company. I'll go handle this because even at the seed stage, it was a full-time job. And, you know, every, every round, you know, at, at Electric, COVID, you know, onward was hop on Zoom, do the thing, get back to work. Yeah, I mean, and you have this weird thing where as human beings, if you're going to fly out for a meeting, well, of course, I'm going to take you for a meal. Of course, we're going to have a meeting. And we probably should do one other thing. So you flew out. I mean, to fly out and do a half hour meeting, be like, bye. I mean, it was like. Well, I Ryan, Ryan, Ryan can attest to this. He crushed me in SoulCycle before we invested. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I'll, 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 give, I'll give, Jeff a, <laughs> give Jeff a lot a lot of credit. I think he emailed me on a Monday. I said, hey, I think the round's coming together quickly. He's like, we can be there tomorrow to take you for dinner. I said, hey, well, I promised the team I would go with them to uh, SoulCycle after work. He goes, I'm there. Love it. Ooh, we, Jeff, up. We, we had the Jeff little barbecue. Uh, we had a little barbecue steak and and uh, and Soul Cycle and Ryan. Ryan put. Thankfully, there was somebody else on the team. I, I'm a larger human being. There was somebody else who was my size who rode in the back with me. We, I didn't have to be too embarrassed there under the candlelight at Soul Cycle. But Ryan was clocking, you know, f- however fast you were riding while I was in the back huffing and puffing. Well, what matters is you might you might have lost the Soul Cycle class, but you won the deal. Yeah, so. <laughs> I was I like gonna it. say that's how you know a round is truly oversubscribed, Jeff. When uh, when you get beaten in Soul Cycle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was fun though. On that note, uh, let let's wrap up uh, with uh, Jeff's latest three investments, and also Ryan, uh, you could tell the audience a little bit about Electric and uh, what you're looking for in the market. Yeah, Ryan, you get a full plug. Go for it. Tell us about the company, who your customers are, and who you're hiring. Thank you. Yeah, Electric is the easiest way for small businesses to manage IT. You want to manage your devices, software, uh, get more secure. We are designed specifically for companies that don't have any in-house IT staff. Mm. So if you are a small business and you care about the security of your employee and customer data, and you care about your staff not wasting time doing things like buying and provisioning computers, go to electric.ai check it out, sign up for our freemium product online. Um, and anything else you need, I mean, feel free to hit me up directly. I'm very easy to reach and we love our customers. Uh, who, uh, who are you hiring for? You, you hire a bunch of IT professionals across the country to work on this? Uh, no, you know, at the moment, we, we really don't have, have too many open positions. We've got just it. got a absolutely, absolutely rocking team. So um, yeah. Speaking of remote work, do people want to put employee monitoring systems on is that becoming a thing it keeps coming up like um and I, you know i wouldn't do it with the high-end employees we have but call centers record everything on a computer if you want to work from home for jet blue doing customer support you, you, you don't expect that like the screen's not recorded the whole time and they're tracking you and how many calls you're doing and i looked into it because i wanted to increase productivity at our company and i was like hey is there a way people could get a private report or maybe them and their manager of just how much work they did because we can see it in Slack and Notion and Google Docs. Like we can see your activity. So if you think somebody was screwing around, you could say, how many days did they log into Slack? And I look at, I don't look at it every month, but I've looked at maybe twice in the last year, just who logs into Slack every day, right? Um, and it was pretty interesting to see who was like 30 of 30 days and who was 19 of 30 days. And did they well, take any vacation famous, days? there was that yeah. famous incident when Marissa took over as CEO of Yahoo and they had like 10,000 employees that were all working from home and i guess they pulled the records for their vpn and ultimately what she found is that the vast majority of employees when they were working from home uh were in fact not working because they weren't even logging to the vpn so they couldn't actually engage in any work i think what a lot of companies realized was that was more a function of working at yahoo at that time <laughs> than it was with anything else <laughs> Yeah. Uh, so, do people want re- remote employee monitoring, and what's the best practice? We, there? Yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't see that. You know, um, mm. and that's also something that we we always we always tell our customers. You know, we have an, an agent that's installed on the machine that cannot see anything that you're mm. actually doing. It's really just looking at the health and the security of Got the it. device. We have no idea what you're doing. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you know the the what we see across particularly our startup customers. The, the departments where that, that really matters is ultimately either sales or, or engineering. Pretty easy for engineering teams to see just what, you know, the amount of code that folks are committing and pretty easy looking at Salesforce reports, uh, who's actually getting in there and making calls. So, um, I don't want to say it's a solved problem, but I think for the, for the people where it matters, a lot of the tools they use today can kind of tell them who's busy and who's not. 
All right, lightning round, Jeff, you're three. Go. All right, three companies we recently invested in. Uh, we have a company called Homebase that is uh, kind of an operating system for small businesses. So 200,000 merchants in America, roughly 2 million workers are on the app. This is obviously something I'm very passionate about. We talked about it earlier in the pod. Great company, John Waldman, terrific founder. He and Rishi have built this thing over the last decade. So note to founders, it takes time to build great companies, but this is a company that is you know, valued in the hundreds of millions of dollars, north of 50 million in ARR, growing very quickly, doing well. Uh, and just a company that we're really excited about and extremely well run. And I, and I will just tell, you know, note to the world out there, it is very challenging to raise capital right now uh, at this stage for companies. And this is a real testament to the cohort data, the margins, you know, all the things we talked about earlier, these guys have their stuff together. And it's, uh, it's just an impressive team that we think is building in a great space, similar to what HubSpot did, Toast did, Square did, Shopify did going after this, you know, 40% of the economy that is small businesses. So home base, really exciting company. Second, I'll give you Arteria. It's uh, an AI bet. Ryan mentioned earlier, vertical AI. So uh, this is a company that's going after the banking industry, probably also will go after insurance, healthcare, energy, places where a lot of uh, contracts, agreements, documentation, a lot of data surrounding all of that, very important to the businesses. You think about the banking industry, literally executing contracts and trades every day. It's a lot of data there. They've built a proprietary set of, uh, of AI that can extract information from that and help companies make better decisions on the fly and also just understand risk exposure and things that are really important to these very large companies that are very important to our economy. And then the third one is a company called Vercel. Hopefully, all of you guys have heard of Vercel. Uh, it's an incredible infrastructure company, modern developer platform. Oh, every month, over a million developers are building new projects on Vercel and launching them. Huge beneficiary of what's happening with Gen AI and, and just an amazing founder in Guillermo, who has also become a, a great co-investor for us and great angel investor that we've partnered with on a number of new investments. So Purcell is one of those companies that we think is very well positioned to take advantage of everything that's happening in AI. Uh, it's on the infrastructure side, so not something you will hear as much about unless you're uh, a developer, in which case you probably love Purcell. So another company we're excited about. Fantastic. Take us out, David. What a great episode. Amazing. I love having Ryan on because Ryan is an angel investor and a founder. That is really dynamic to have you have both of those hats on. And, and Jeff, great job. Excellent. Well, it's been another great episode of the Liquidity Podcast. I love the discussion for Jeff Richards, Ryan Dennehy, Jason Calacanis. This is your host, David Weisberg. Thanks for listening. 